1866, Prussia answered the German question by invading the Austrian Empire and forcing their 36-year-old emperor, Franz Joseph, to renounce the presidency of the German Confederation, which was dissolved shortly afterwards. The Prussians went on to unite Germany into the powerful German Empire, which, at least for the next few decades, had a bright future ahead of it. But in Austria, things were quite a bit more dire. Their defeat to the Prussians and their Italian allies, who took Austria's most valuable province, the Kingdom of Lombardy-Venetia, pushed the Austrian Empire into a state of economic and social chaos that it hadn't seen since the Hungarian Revolution of 1848, which had forced Franz Joseph's uncle, Ferdinand I, to abdicate. The Hungarian rebels in 1848 had fought for, and very nearly won, complete independence from the Austrian Empire, but with the help of some 200,000 Russian soldiers, they were put down by the end of 1849, and Hungary was placed under an Austrian military dictatorship. Before the revolution, they had enjoyed some privileges within the empire, recorded in the Pragmatic Sanction of 1723 and Hungary's centuries-old constitution. But with Austria weakened thanks to the Prussians, Hungarian leaders saw an opportunity to re-establish their sovereignty. This time, though, through peaceful means. The future Prime Minister of Hungary, Count Gyula Andrasi, who had previously been exiled for his participation in the revolution, met with Franz Joseph at the end of the Austro-Prussian War, after it had become clear that the Austrian Empire had lost. Andrasi formally recommended that the Emperor restore the old Hungarian constitution, as well as grant Hungary complete internal independence from the Austrian Empire. Both of those would be formalized in the Austro-Hungarian Compromise signed in May 1867. The key word, though, was internal, as Hungary and Austria kept a joint foreign policy and continued to support each other militarily. Also, Franz Joseph remained Emperor of Austria and was crowned King of Hungary, maintaining the power that his dynasty, the House of Habsburg and its cadet branch, the House of Habsburg-Lorraine, had held in Central Europe since the 15th century. The new state was named the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Austria-Hungary, or less formally, the Dual Monarchy. The empire lasted from 1867 until its collapse at the end of the First World War in 1918, and was the last iteration of a series of states which today are grouped together as the Habsburg Monarchy. In 1914, the now very elderly Franz Joseph's nephew and heir, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist as he was visiting Sarajevo, the capital of the province of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which had been annexed by Austria-Hungary in 1908. His death was the most immediate cause of World War I, but that very easily might not have been the case. You see, Franz Ferdinand became his uncle's heir in 1896, after his father, Franz Joseph's brother, died of typhoid fever. The Emperor had actually had a son of his own before that, Crown Prince Rudolf, but he committed suicide in 1889, leaving Franz Ferdinand to eventually become heir. Besides being assassinated, the Archduke is most well known for sponsoring a 1906 proposal, the United States of Greater Austria, which was a theoretical solution to the biggest problem that Austria-Hungary faced for its entire existence, and ultimately the issue that doomed it to dissolution. Despite the fact that the empire was named for the Austrians and Hungarians, they only made up about 44% of its population. The rest of Austria-Hungary was inhabited by nine other major ethnic groups, none of whom were particularly thrilled about being ruled by Vienna and Budapest. Franz Ferdinand's plan would have federalized Austria-Hungary into 15 equally powerful states, ensuring that every ethnic group within the Union would have been represented. Which does make it a bit ironic that he was killed by a nationalist. Anyway, Franz Ferdinand's death caused outrage in Vienna and across the world, but as his assassin, Gavrilo Princip, had been a Serb, it also presented the Empire with an excuse to use military force against Serbia, which had been promoting pan-Slavic nationalism among Slovene, Croatian, and Serbian subjects of Austria-Hungary in the Balkans. Austria-Hungary issued an ultimatum of ten demands to the Serbian government, which, if they had been accepted, would have turned Serbia, effectively, into an Austro-Hungarian satellite state. And that was intentional. The higher-ups in Austria-Hungary's military were actively searching for any opportunity to go to war with Serbia. So, they may have been somewhat surprised when Serbia accepted, at least to some extent, nine out of the ten demands listed in the ultimatum. Everything except allowing Austro-Hungarian police to enter Serbia. 
The Serbs trusted that their ally, Russia, would defend them from any Austro-Hungarian aggression, though the Russians, as well as Britain and France, actually encouraged Serbia to accept the ultimatum outright in the interests of peace. For their part, the Austro-Hungarians have been emboldened to send the ultimatum in the first place because of a blank check of unconditional support from the German Emperor Wilhelm II. The German and Austro-Hungarian empires had repaired relations in the decade following the Austro-Prussian War and became allies in 1879, explicitly to counter Russian influence. Three years later, Italy allied with the two empires as well, though they didn't join them in World War I and actually ended up siding with the Entente. Austria-Hungary performed pretty terribly during the war and they had to rely on their German allies for support in practically every engagement they entered. They couldn't even crush Serbia, which had a population ten times smaller than Austria-Hungary's and was the whole point of the war in the first place on their own. They needed significant help from the Germans, including the sending of the German 11th Army away from the Western Front and into the Balkans, and giving command of the Serbian campaign to German Field Marshal August von Mackensen, as well as a Bulgarian invasion of Eastern Serbia. They did fare slightly better fighting against the Russians in Galicia, a primarily Polish and Ukrainian part of northern Austria-Hungary, and then in the Gorlish Tarno offensive which invaded Russia proper. But still, Germany dominated Austria-Hungary's military policy, and they acted more like a German subordinate than an ally. They also held off the Italians, who entered the war against them in 1915 after the Entente promised them large portions of Austria-Hungary's coast after the war. Austria-Hungary even managed to penetrate northeastern Italy in the Trentino Offensive and threatened Venice, but much like on the Western Front, Austria-Hungary and Italy soon found themselves embroiled in trench warfare and stalemate. The biggest reason for Austria-Hungary's lacklustre performance in the war were 1. General incompetence among Austria-Hungary's corrupt officer corps, and 2. The division of their military into Austrian-commanded and Hungarian-commanded armies. But the most impactful cause of Austro-Hungarian failure, especially in the last years of the war, was the problem that Franz Ferdinand had tried to solve back in 1906. The differing ethnic groups of the empire had no real reason to see it succeed. By 1917 and 1918, desertion rates within Austria-Hungary's armies skyrocketed, as it became clear that the war wasn't going to end in any way that would be beneficial to the empire. It didn't help that Austria-Hungary's enemies refused to accept the continuation of the dual monarchy after the war, and one of American President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points called in no uncertain terms for self-government for all of Austria-Hungary's many ethnic groups. In a last-ditch effort to save his empire, the last Habsburg Emperor, Karl I, who had succeeded Franz Joseph, his great-uncle, in 1916, called for a new imperial confederation, similar to Franz Ferdinand's Greater Austria. It received little to no support. On October 17th, 1918, Hungary formally dissolved the personal union with Austria. On the 28th, Czechoslovakia took over control of its territory from the now defunct empire, as did the state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs on the 29th. Poland was reborn out of parts of the German and Russian empires as well as Galicia. Italy received land on its border with Austria, and Romania took Transylvania and Bukovina from Hungary. The Slovenes, Croats, and Bosnian Serbs later joined with Serbia and Montenegro to form the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, Yugoslavia. Emperor Karl renounced his right to participate in state affairs of both Austria and Hungary, but he never officially abdicated. Ultimately, though, that didn't matter, and the Republic of German Austria was declared with the intention of joining Germany, though that wouldn't materialize. A short-lived republic in Hungary was replaced by a kingdom under a regency, though a monarch was never crowned. Formally, the empire was dissolved by the Treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye between the Entente and Austria and the Treaty of Trianon between them and Hungary. Austria and Hungary each lost well over half of their pre-war lands, Hungary specifically lost over 70% of the territory it held in 1914, as well as over 60% of its population. The former Emperor Karl died in exile in 1922, without ever having renounced his claim to both Austria and Hungary. His son, Otto von Habsburg, Austria's last crown prince, later served as a member of the European Parliament and declared himself to be a loyal citizen of the Republic of Austria in 1961. Hey look, you made it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next one. And as always, I've been James and thank you for watching Look Back History.